deeds. Two minutes. What? Two minute warning. Damn, dude, I gotta go like use the internet. Hold on. <laughs> you don't get the internet in the, in the actual exam, Pat. <laughs> That's how many chains, right? Yes. Okay. Getting close. I don't know how to do that. <laughs> uh, how many you got left, Gustavo? Three. Three? Gustavo started a little bit late. Pencils down. All right, so we're going to grade these. You guys understand why I time it? What, yeah. what, am, I, what am I trying to teach it? Uh, the the test, test taking skill. Yeah, so like, you know, if there's a question on there that takes a bunch of math, skip it. you skip it. Because that one, they're all worth the same. When you take the CST or the LSIT, all the questions are worth the same. All right, let's go through these. Question one, which of the following is an example of a controlling call in the land description? The answer is C, along the center line of Landon's Creek. Dude, you okay. see, you put your name in there, so I was like, <laughs> not that one. No. <laughs> okay, so let's just run through the, those answers real quick. A is what I call a course. That's a bearing or distance, bearing and distance course, okay? B is, is just a, a call for area. That's an aliquot part, the west half of section 12. And uh, D is a call. The D is uh, usually the, the little area statement that goes on the end of a description. So the answer is C, along the center line of Landon's Creek. So that's a land description question. Okay, question number two. Cross sections are surveys at regular intervals in what type of surveys? Okay, so the answer is A, a route surveys and hydrographic surveys for flood modeling. 
Okay, so when you're going to do a route survey, a lot of times you just go out and they tell you, they tell you, we call, we say cut, cut a section every hundred feet. Okay, so you just you're surveying uh, field, uh, toe of slope, top of slope, EP, edge of travel away or white stripe, center line, crown. Then you go back down the other side. That's cross section. You do the same thing when you're doing surveys for flood modeling in a, in a creek or a river, you do cross sections across the channel every so many feet, usually upstream and downstream of a bridge, okay? So cross sections? Cross section is just, you're surveying a slice across something, across a creek or a river or across a road, okay? You've done okay. templates before where um, you see just a bunch of lines going across the road and then it's another hundred feet and a line going across the river points. So. Okay, so the, the difference between so that's like a cheap way to do it. The way I like to do it is what they call a brake line survey, which is where you're following every brake line. You follow the EP, you follow the toe slope, and you get to every angle point, every high level. That's the right way to do it. Cross sections are kind of a, ch a cheaper way to do it. Gotcha. Yeah, I've okay? done one like that with the cross section. All right, question number three. Obviously, I screwed up, so skip that one. Question four, which of the following? allows a static GNS survey to be placed on the U.S. National Spatial Reference Frame. Okay, when I say U.S. National Spatial Reference Frame, I'm just, that's the, that's the technical term for the, the system that is used for state plane coordinates. Okay, it's a federal system. Which agency maintains it? NGS, National Geodetic Survey. The answer to the question is D, NGS cores. Continually operating reference station. Okay, so let's just go through why those other answers are wrong. A, RTN base station. That's something in, that a private vendor has set up. So we use CSDS. Okay, B, Coast Guard, Coast Guard differential GPS station. That's a real thing. That's what you use for like a GIS grade receiver. You can tap into one of those. Okay, so it's not survey grade, it's GIS grade. And C, I just made up because it sounded cool. Okay, so the answer is D, NGS cores. Question five, what is the on the ground length of a line that is 3.56 inches long on a map sheet with a scale of one to 24,000? I guarantee you, you're gonna get questions like this on your LSIT. 85,440. Okay, the answer is, I don't remember. I think it's C. That's what I got. Okay, so here's what you have to do. You gotta learn a little bit about scale. There's two types of scale, map scales. There's relative, and there's what they call an engineer scale. So this is relative scale. What that colon means, the two dots means one, one unit on the map is a unit on the ground. So one foot on the ground is 24,000 feet on the ground. One inch on the, on the map is 24,000 inches on the ground. That is not the type of scale we use here usually. We use an engineer scale, which is one inch equals X number of feet. So you have to convert. So look, if you just take 24,000, if you take 24,000 times the 3.56, you're going to get A. You can't do that. You got to take 24,000 divided by 12, 12 inches in a foot, and then multiply that by 3.56. Okay? This type of scale right here, 1 to 24,000, that relative scale is used by GIS and cartography people. Okay, so 1 to 24,000, if you've ever gone hunting or hiking or fishing, that's the scale of a quad map. USGS quad map is 1 to 24,000. Okay, you got to understand the difference between those and know how to convert because I guarantee you you're going to have those questions on the LSIT. Okay. All right, question six. What data indicates a potential problem with the to topographic survey of a residential lot and home surveyed with a total station? This came up this week. That's why it's on here. So the answer is B, if you have spot elevations next to each other on a concrete patio with an elevation difference of one foot, what probably happened? Rod bust. Rod bust. Okay. Why is it not C or D? Why are C and D not problems? Oh, uh, contours are generated. What kind of survey are we doing? Yeah, that's true. It's a topo survey. What's our method, though? A topo survey using what method? Total station. So, can you have contours under a tree or an elevated deck if you're doing a survey with a total station? No, because you don't. Yes, because you take shots under the trees. No, GPS is the, a 
GPS is the other way around, okay? All right. Seven is a boo-boo, sorry. Eight, a bipod. Okay, so, Pat, the instrument goes on a tripod most of the time. Total station goes on a tripod. The prism or the glass or the mirror goes on a rod, okay? So you can freehand the rod if you're good. I'm not, I go like this, okay? But Danny probably goes like this, okay? Because you want to keep it plumb, right? Okay, but if you're doing a really tight survey, you need a really tight survey, especially horizontal, you use a bipod because it holds the rod steady. Okay? The little ones that just have like the hold up, hold the rod. Yes, now think about this before I answer the question. If you don't have a bipod and your rod's shaking a little bit, what's going to be worse, your horizontal or your vertical? Uh, vertical. No. Nope. I mean horizontal. Your horizontal is going to be worse. Okay, so let's look at the answer to the question. The answer is, should be used for D. You see how tight that horizontal tolerance is? 5 sixteenths of an inch? You gotta use a bipod for that. If you're freehanding those shots, you, we're not gonna be able to meet the spec. So I'll give you another example when this comes up. If the guys are shooting curb, and they're shooting the top face of the curb and the flow line, and they're not using a bipod, when you get that in CAD pad, what does it do? They crisscross, right? If they use a bipod, they shouldn't crisscross like that. All right, number nine. A lane description has the following two courses. Along the south line of Bog Street, north, 010010 east to an iron pipe, blah, 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 I'm not gonna read the whole thing. What is the angle between the south line of Bog Street and the west line of Kano Avenue? Okay, so here's the key. You gotta take the two bearings and you gotta subtract north 10010 east from north 8920020 east. Okay, and the answer is C, 880010, right? So 89 minus the 1 is 8, 88 degrees, 0, 0 minus 0, 0, 0, 0, 20 minus 10 is 10. Okay, if you put A, you forgot to subtract the north 0, 1, 0, 0, 10. And if you got D, you added it, it says subtracting. And if you got B, you just can't do math and you should be fired. Okay? Well, <laughs> All right, 10. I don't know what to do, I guessed. 10. So do you understand, Pat? We've got a bearing and a bearing. Subtract one from the other gives you the angle. Okay, and if, you, if you're not sure on that one and you have time, you can sketch that out. I tried. Right? Yeah, okay, okay. there you go. Right. That's, why we do, that's why we practice. 10. The strip description for a utility pole easement has the following three center line courses, and I give them to you. They're in chains. I saw one this week that was in chains. It happens. How many feet are in a chain? 66. Okay, so you got to know a couple things to answer this question. You got to know how many feet are in a chain. You got to know how to convert from chains to feet, and then you got to know how to convert from feet to meters. Centimeters. Centimeters, sorry. So, yeah. <laughs> I okay. don't think any of those answers are Plus, you got to know how to add. So, let's just do the math real quick. Let's just add these up. Wait, so 66 feet, or a chain 66 feet? Chain is right? 66 feet. So, you don't just 42.6 times 6? 66? No, because you got to add them. I said, what's the length of this easement center line? You got to add all those together, right? Yeah. Or, yeah, you can add them and then multiply them. Yeah, or you can do it the other way. You're right, Pat. You can do it the other way. So let's just do the math real quick 42.6 plus 12.4 plus 4.2. So I got 59.2 chains. Okay, now you notice that's an answer. Why is that an answer? Throw you off. Yeah, we're trying to trick people. That's what they do. Okay, so times 66, okay, is 3907.2. Now, if I was smart, that would be an answer too, but I'm not that smart. I should have put that on there. Okay, now, we got to know how many feet are in a meter. Centimeter. How many centimeters, sorry. So, I don't know. what is that? That's feet? Yeah, so we're going to divide that by 3.2808333333. That's the rough conversion. Okay. I screwed this one up. You wrote centimeters, that's why. I'm I, like, I screwed this one up. Bro, if you would put meters, I would be like, oh, point Yeah, two. so this is a bad, you can't get that one right. Sorry, I'll, I need to fix it. Do you guys understand the process though, what you gotta do? Sum them up times 66, okay? Multiply by 3.2808, okay? Now, how many places do you show to get a value in metric to the nearest centimeter? 
How many places behind the decimal? Two. Two. Near centimeters two, millimeters three. That's part of what I was trying to test there. Okay, so if I say near a centimeter, you don't even have to do the math. It should be B. Because that's the only answer there with a with a depth with two two places beyond the digit. Okay? Alright. Bonus question one. On a topo survey, the benchmark statement provides what information to the map reader? The answer should be A. Basis of elevation and the vertical datum. People come up to me all the time and say, Landon, I've got this topo survey. I need the benchmark, the basis of bearings. And I say, no, you don't. Because if you don't have a boundary on there and you didn't show any bearings, do you need a basis of bearing? Bearings? No. What do you need? Benchmark a benchmark statement. Bonus question two. What factor determining accuracy is key when planning the layout of a horizontal control network to be surveyed using toll station methods? The answer is A, strength of figure and elevation. No, hold on. Sorry, it's, it's, uh, it's D, strength of figure and distance between stations. Okay, I said horizontal control, control network, so we can automatically throw out two answers. Which two can we throw out? A and B. Okay, because we're not worried about vertical. So that leaves us with C and D. Okay, does it really matter how many stations you have in the network? No, it really doesn't matter. So we can get to this by process of elimination. Okay, do we know what strength of figure is? It's okay if you don't. I know Elena doesn't. I don't. Okay, so let's talk about strength of figure. Oh, uh, the geometry. Yep, if you have point A and point B, okay, there's three scenarios here. If you have really narrow angles, small angles here, and you're trying to find a point here, okay, then you've got angles that are roughly 60 degrees, and then you got really narrow angles. So these angles are close to 90, okay? These two suck. We say they have weak strength of figure. This is the strongest, the strongest strength of figure you can have, 60, 60, 60, and I'm gonna explain why. If we're measuring these angles, and we get we get the lines off to the, we get the angles off a little bit and we project these lines out what's this distance going to be it's going to be big if we're here and we get these off angles off a little bit do you guys see how this distance here is much smaller so that's going to come up a little bit later when we talk about resections Okay, but that's what strength of figure means. Okay? So you don't want really fat or really tall and skinny triangles. You want nice proportions. All right. Okay, we're going to talk today about angles and directions a little bit. This is kind of back to basics, but Elena's been trying to cocoa deeds. So I thought this would be a good class for her. Okay. So I made you guys a cheat sheet. The other reason this came up is because we had a question on a quiz last time about measuring, doing some math with the horizontal circle on a total station. You guys freaked out. Okay, so I want to make sure you understand it. <laughs> okay, so let's just go over some basics. Let's talk about azimuths first. Azimuths are measured from 0 to 360. Okay, an azimuth is a measurement of a direction. So if I tell my wife, Monique, Ross, is there's north sweetheart ross is 180 degrees from you two miles which way does she go that way that's a direction i'm telling her which direction to go okay so zero to 360 degrees okay now azimuths are kind of a pain in the butt so surveyors use something different we use bearings okay but i want you guys to understand azimuths and bearings are both different ways to write the same thing it's to describe a direction okay so bearings, this is what I taught Elena this week. Bearings are divided into four quadrants, each of 90 degrees. And we use these numbers in CAD when we do bearings. Quadrant northeast, that's number one. Quadrant two, southeast number two. Southwest number three, northwest number four. Okay, now there's a couple things, a couple reasons why. Why do surveyors use bearings? I want you guys to see bearings are interchangeable. So if you have a bearing of northwest 4500 east, and you want to go the opposite direction, what's your bearing? Southwest. It's really easy, you just swap the quadrant. You don't get to do that if you use azimuths, 
right? So if this azimuth down here, you can see I drew it up here, is 225 and you want to go the opposite direction, you got to do the math. You got a minus 180 to come up with 45, right? So that's why surveyors use bearings. One of the reasons we use bearings. The other reason we use bearings is because it makes it really easy to do Kogo. Okay, I want you guys to imagine for a minute for a world, we've got a world with no bearings. Okay, and you're trying to draw a D. Okay, and I give you these distances. Okay. And these angles, like you'd have to go in here, copy this line, rotate at that angle, then trim or extend at the right length, right? That would be, a, you can do that, but it would be a pain in the butt. So Kobo is a lot easier. That's part of the reason we came up with this, okay? And here's something else I want you to understand. Bearings and azimuths require some reference line. We usually use due north, okay? So if I give you a bearing, if I say, Danny, go north 45 degrees east, but I don't tell Danny which way north is, does, it, does that do Danny any good? No. No, it doesn't do him any good. He's got to know what the, how are we determining those directions. So bearings, an azimuth, that you need to know which way north is, or those numbers don't really mean anything to you. Okay? So for example, if a guy goes out with a total station, and he sets up on a point, and he picks a backside, and he says, I'm just going to backside. I'm going to call that zero, zero, but I don't know which way he's pointing. Am I going to be able to put his data in the real world? No. Now, I'm not going to know how he's oriented, right? It, he could be spinning. He needs, to, he needs to lock me in in relation to something physical, okay? So, bearings and azimuths are directions. Okay, so here's what you can do, though. If you have two azimuths or two bearings, you can calculate an angle, right? So I drew that for you. Here's a bearing going north 45 east. Here's another bearing coming south, southeast. You guys can see the angle in between those is 65 degrees, right? Okay, so I want you guys to understand this. If you're looking at a map or a drawing and you see a line with two bearings on it, it's just a different way to write the angle in between the lines. Does that make sense? It's just a different way to express the angle, okay? Okay, so let's talk about the number one things people screw up when they're, when they're working with angles and directions. Let's say you've got two deeds or two survey maps, and you've got the same line. So let's say it's the line between point one and two. And Elena's looking at one, and she says, hey, in this deed, the line between one and two is north 90 degrees east, and in this deed, the line between one and two is north 89 degrees east. Those are a whole degree different. Which one is right? Can she ask that question? Sure, no. She can ask it, but there isn't a good answer. Yeah. Okay, there's not a good answer because those two, can you compare bearings if they, if they aren't on the same basis of bearing? No. You can't. So the only way to compare bearings on two different documents is to make sure they're on the same basis of bearing. Okay, so that's why in CAD, when we're building a record drawing, if I Kogo map, map A and I Kogo map B and they're not on the same basis of bearing, as soon as I put map B in my drawing with map A, what do I got to do to map B? I got to rotate it to match map A on a common line. We got to put them on the same basis of bearing. Okay. Now, you don't have to do that with angles. Okay. So if you've got a map and you calculate this angle is 90, and you come over here and you calculate this angle from the bearings, they don't have to be on the same basis of bearing. You can compare those two angles. Okay. A lot of people don't like, I, I see some puzzled looks, but just remember, you can't compare bearings from different data sets if you don't know for sure you're not on a common basis of bearing. So if you're not sure you can't compare bearings, what do you got to do with your data set? Calculate the angles and compare the angles. Oh, I see what you mean. Now. Does that make sense? Yeah, if it's like on a different, it's almost right? like if they're on two different UCSs. Yes, mm -hmm. that's a CAD user. Yeah, you got two different UCSs. That's a great way to think about it. Well, from, yeah, that's easy way for me to okay. think about it. All right, so let's talk about how this works with the horizontal circle on a total station. So I got an example here. Okay, so we go out. So we're looking at the pink numbers are the, the azimuths on the compass. So this is north. Okay, the orange dial 
is the horizontal circle on our total station. Okay? So we're going to say we're at point number 100. We're set up on 100, and we're looking over here at 102. Sorry, 101. Okay. Okay. So, what's the azimuth of our backside? 45. 45. Okay. That's the real world azimuth. Okay. But we want to go out and we want to measure an angle down here to point number 101. So if you guys have run a total station, you'll know how this works. You set on 100, you look at 101, and you set your back sight to zero. Okay? Now, that's done digitally now, but in the old days, there was actually a dial on your instrument that you would turn. If you, some of the levels still have them. If you get an automatic level, there's a little dial on the bottom that you can spin, and you spin zero to where it's lined up with the scope. What's the, uh, the one that... Steve's using the digital or di the digi. Yeah, that one has a, a little dial. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So right. So that's what it's doing inside the machine. When you're in your data collector and you tell it set zero on the back site, it says, "All right, I'm going to turn my digital dial to 45 and I'm going to set it at zero." Okay. All right. Now, total stations by default measure angles to the right, clockwise. Okay. They don't measure angles to the left unless you tell them to. Okay, so we spin over to 101 and we measure an angle, okay? So if I told you this is 135, what's the angle we just measured? 90. 90 degrees. This angle right here is 90 degrees. So the total station, when you look at the little readout on the horizontal angle, it's going to say 90.00.00, .00, okay? Now this gets me back to the question that I asked earlier. Because there's imperfections in the way all those measurements take place inside of the piece of equipment, sometimes when you set your zero, it doesn't set to exactly zero. It sets to 0 0.00.04. You get a little slop. Okay, so when you come down here and read your angle, you can't just look at the you can't just look at the angle that you're reading on your foresight. You've got to subtract the slop. Okay, so here's how it works. You got to remember, in any angle on a total station, you're going to have a back sight reading, which is like an azimuth. And you're going to have a foresight reading, which is like an azimuth. You can't just treat your foresight reading like it's an angle, right? Because this may not be perfectly zeroed. So you always have to what? Subtract this one from that one. Okay, that's how that works. But I want you guys to understand that's what the piece of equipment is doing. It's zero, when you tell it zero your backside, it's saying, all right, I'm gonna make this line right here zero and all my angles are gonna be based off of that. Okay, now let me tell you how this, why this might come up in the real world, because I've had this happen. And if you don't understand some of the concepts we just talked about, you won't, you won't be able to fix this. Do you get a guy goes out, he sets up on 100 and he shoots 101, and he's supposed to zero the back sight, but his, his scope is facing the wrong direction. And instead of getting set to zero, his back sight gets set to what? 180. 180. Because it's backwards. And so he turns all his angles based off of 180 back sight. And so when you get it into AutoCAD, what's wrong with your data? It's all 180. It's mirrored. And you're looking at it, you're going like, I don't know what the heck he did. Right? The other, re the other way that can happen is if you're on a flat sight and 100 and 101 are pretty close to the same elevation and this guy messes up and he says, he's at set at 100 and he's back sight 101, but he says I'm set at 101 and I'm back sight 100. His day is gonna be mirrored, okay? But you have to understand how a total station works to be able to figure that out, okay? All right, we're gonna go over real quick some basic, seven basic operations with the total station because Danny's falling asleep. He's been getting here too early. Okay, so one is traverse. What does it mean when, when we say traverse, what does that mean? What kind of operation are we talking about in the total station? So I'm going to draw you an example. There's two types of traverse. You can do an open traverse or a closed traverse. Okay? We like to do a closed traverse. We don't traverse very much anymore because we have GPS to do control, static GPS, but in the old days they traversed all the time. Okay? 
So here's what here's what we mean when we say traverse. We got 0.100 and 0.101 with known values. Okay. And we want to set a new point. Let's say we're trying to get around a building. So we actually want to set two new points. So we want to set 102 and 103. Okay. What they'll do is they'll set the total station up here. They'll backside 100, so he sets this to zero. He turns an angle to 102, and he measures this distance. Okay, that allows him to calculate a coordinate at 102. Okay, then he moves the instrument up. Okay, to 102. He backsights 101. He turns over to 103. He measures this angle, and he measures this distance. Now we have a coordinate for 103. This is called a bat. This is called a traverse. Now, if we stop there, that's an open-ended traverse. Now we have a coordinate on 103, but we haven't checked it. So what we usually do is we say, "Hey, you got to set up not one more time, twice," and I'll explain why. Set up again at 103, backside 102, turn side, turn this angle, measure this distance to 100. Okay. Now, as soon as he does that we get a check on the distance because he'll get another point. Are these, are they, so we're going to say this is 100A and then when he shoots it to close, he calls it 100B. Are those in the same spot? No. They're always different. A few hundreds, two hundreds, a few hundreds, a tenth, depending on how far you go. Okay. Okay, but he's not done yet because have we measured this angle here? No. We can calculate it from these two bearings, but we haven't measured this angle. So what we make him do is we make him go do an extra setup. So he sets up here you got to remember, he never set here, did he? No. So he's got a set here, and he measures this angle. Okay, now we have four angles, and we know that for any four-sided figure, right, how many degrees in a four-sided figure? 90. 360. Oh, sorry. Okay, so we add all our angles up. Are we going to get 360.00.00? No. It's going to be something slightly different. And then we can do our magic, survey our magic, and we spread that out. Okay? That's a traverse. Okay, let's talk about, so if my guys are setting control on a site and we're not using static GPS, really, if we're doing a good job, what's the only other way they should be allowed to set control? Traverse. A closed traverse that gets adjusted. We don't do that, we cheat, but that should be how we do it. Okay. How do we do it then? We're gonna use some of these other funky methods down here I'm gonna talk about in a minute. Okay, so. Let's talk about direct reverse. So here's what we like to do. When we're at 101 and we turn this angle to 102, we make them do it twice. We call it direct and reverse, or face one, face two. You might have that on a test question, face one, face two, or I call it direct reverse. So what they do is they measure the angle, they turn it direct and they measure the angle, then they plunge the scope 180 degrees and they repeat that measurement. Okay, and the reason they do that is because that horizontal circle, that protractor that they have in the instrument, has imperfections. So the angle you measure in the direct face isn't the same as the angle you measure in the reverse. So we make them measure it twice, and then what do we do with those two measurements? Meet them. We average them. It helps wash out the error. Okay, so you'll, you'll see on my field packages when I'm lining out a crew and they're set control, I tell them, use a bipod, direct reverse observations when you're setting control of the toll station, okay? Okay, so we got this one, check, check. Resection, that's our favorite method that I absolutely hate, okay? Party chiefs like resections because they're lazy. So let me explain what happens when you resection. So let's say we've gone out here and we've done our traverse, and the guys come back and 102 is gone, and they need to do some work over here, okay? So this guy's got two choices now. He can set at 101, and he can repeat this and set 102, and then he can go to 102, check 103, and do his work. How many setups is that? Two. two. He's got to set here to put in 102, and he's got to set here to do his work. So there's a shortcut. If he doesn't want to set up on 101, he just comes over here and sets a new point. We're going to call it 102B. And he does what's called a resection. He comes over here and he measures the angle to here and the distance and he measures the angle and distance to here and the computer knows what this baseline is and it does an intersection calculation to figure out what 102 is. 
So he just saved himself what? What did he save? He saved a setup. Now, here's the problem with resections. You got to remember they're a shortcut. What, Elena? How old are you, Elena? 18. Elena is 18 years old. Elena, what have you learned in life about shortcuts? They're the best. You're killing me. <laughs> She's like, they're the best. Oh, my God. All right. Gustavo, how old are you? 47. Gustavo, at 47 years of old of age, what have you learned in life about shortcuts? They don't pay off. All right. See, that's the difference between 18 <laughs> and 47. You could ask 24 and be like, All right. Okay, that? so a shortcut? do you remember what we talked about, strength of figure? Okay, so if the guys don't have a nice square, this wouldn't be a bad resection because these ain't, how, how close am I to, I'm like between 60 and 90, that's pretty good, right? Okay, but what, what your party chief will do is he'll be, he'll be needing to work right here and he'll have a control point over here and he'll have a control point over here and he'll set a new one over here and he'll resection off this tube. Okay, how's that strength of figure? Horrible. It sucks. And he'll do a bunch of work and guess, guess what? How, how bad, what's this, how bad is that floating around? Pretty bad. Yeah, it could be three tenths. We just had this happen on a job. Which job was it? Does anybody remember? Washington? Nueva. Nueva. Oh, Nueva. Everybody oh. that's been out has been resectioning, and we had one guy's resection didn't match another guy's. Right? And I'm not surprised because it was probably a crappy angle. Okay? So I have a couple rules. If my part, First of all, I tell my part chiefs, if I catch you doing a resection, I'm going to break your fingers. Okay? But if you must do a resection, okay? So like if every if like you had a bunch of control and it got all wiped out. I can't think of a reason when you would have to do one. That's, well, no, that's, also that's I'll give you an example. <laughs> so in order to do what I'm talking about here, this point has to be in. Oh gotcha, okay. Right? Let's just say that these two points got wiped. Can he see between one and one oh three? One oh one and one oh three? No. He can't. So what's the only way you could get this back? To redo the whole entire uh, a resection. Matters. You gotta do a resection because okay. these two known points aren't visible. So you gotta do a resection. That's the only time I would allow a party chief to do a resection, okay? And I have two rules for a resection, okay? Your angle better between 60 and 90, better be between 60 and 90 degrees, okay? And we don't do two point resections here. You have to have a third point to check, okay? I guess in that example I just gave, they wouldn't have a third point, but if they did that, if they did a two-point resection to set 102B, what I would do is when they got when they got done working at 102B, I'd make them come over here at 103 and shoot that again and try and check it. Because we just we have a crappy situation here. Okay? Alright, that's resection. Check. Angle by deflection. We don't do this very much anymore, but they used to, especially when they were doing route surveys, and it could be on a test. So I just want you to understand what it is. Okay? Angle by resection. You're set here on A. You backside B. You turn 180, and then you deflect some angle. So let's say you deflect 30 degrees. That's called an angle by deflection. Okay, and they used to do that when they because like if you're laying if you're laying out curves, you can use this method to set points on curves. We don't do that anymore. We just do all the math in the computer and send you out with a point file. But in the old days when they didn't have computers, they would do angles by deflection because what they would do is that as they're coming around the curve. The midpoint of the curve is at a nice even angle. So that they didn't have to do any math to figure this out. They would just say, oh, I need to turn 30 degrees and go down whatever the radius is and I'll be at the midpoint of the curve. That's where that comes from, angle by deflection, okay? We don't use it. I'm gonna underline this because we don't use it, but you should know what it is. Running line, we don't do that anymore either. We could do this on a job in theory. I've never done it in my career, but you could have to do it. So let's talk about when you wanna run a straight line, okay? So when you want to run a straight line, here's what you do. And it, ha it, ha it all has to do with how that instrument is built. And it has to do with, it's like a direct, it's a special kind of direct reverse. So if you're trying to run it, you're trying to extend the line between A and B, okay? What you do is you come out here and you turn your 180, okay? And you come down here and you set a point. It's a little mark on the ground, a tack or a little ink mark, okay? Then you plunge the scope. Now you're in reverse face. You look at this, you turn 180. You go out your distance, whatever it is, let's say it's 1,000 feet. Is your dot gonna be in the same place? No. Your dot's gonna be over here a little bit. Guess where the true line is? In the middle. Split the difference. You actually get your tape measure out, and you measure it, and you put a mark in the middle, and that's true line. I could see potentially having to do that on 
some kind of building layout maybe is when we would do it. Okay. So that's like to extend. To extend a line, a straight line, yeah. Okay. If we have time, what time is it? We'll talk about grid, we'll talk about laying out grid here in a minute. We're almost done, but that's a good example. Okay, so we talked about running line. Okay, radial tie side shot. That is okay for topo. It's not okay for control. Okay, and what that means is, so you set up at 102, and you just want to turn and shoot this water valve right here. Okay, so your backside 101, and you just turn a single angle. You just turn over a single angle and shoot a distance. That's called a side shot. You just shoot it to the side. Okay, now here's the problem with that. If there's anything wrong with this rod, it's not plumb, or the rod is not set to the right height, or there's anything wrong here, are we ever going to know? No. That's why we don't use side shots for control. Okay? Because there's no check. It's no check. Okay, so that's a radial tie side shot. Okay, trig leveling we don't really do anymore. It's just a fancy term. All it means is you're using the vertical angles on a total station to establish the elevation on another point. Okay, but it could be a test question. It's called trig leveling. Why do they call it trig leveling? What are you using? Trigonometry. The trigonometry on the vertical angle. So let me, Pat's looking a little confused, so let me give him a Well, no, I was thinking, uh, you should talk about building like that, right? That's all right, because I know, yeah, you can. I know Elaine is confused, so let's just draw an example, okay? So, we got a building, and we got our instrument set up right here, okay? Okay, we know what elevation the instrument is, okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to shoot down the bottom of the building, if we want to know how tall it is. We're going to measure this angle. By the way, vertical angles in a total station are measured from the zenith. What does zenith mean? You're pointing straight up. Okay? So you measure this angle from the zenith. Okay? And then we measure another angle from the zenith. Okay? So. We take this zenith angle minus this zenith angle gives us what? The actual angle there, right? Okay, but we're not quite done yet. So, because we leveled up our total station, we know where this, we know where this level plane is, right? You guys realize we can do that. We can take this total, total station out, level it, and we can shoot a level plane with the total station. Okay, so now, do you guys see how we have two right triangles here? Okay. If we know this distance from the total station to here, we know this distance here, x, and we've got a simple right, we could use Pythagorean's theorem and figure this out. We know this angle now, right? And you can do this math and you can figure out how tall the building is. Okay. That process of establishing these ele elevations, so we'll make it a little simpler here. You, the, the, the process of figuring out this elevation difference here, y, from this distance right here, x, and this angle, that's called trigonom trigonometric leveling. Okay? They, they teach this shit in chem. Yeah. Okay. And the girl's going through She's yeah. like, hey, you're a surveyor. How do you yep. do my homework? I'm like, okay, so I don't know. If, I we want, if, if we want really good <laughs> elevations on a job site, what kind of, what kind of leveling do we do, Danny? Do we do trig leveling? Nope. No. What kind of leveling do we do? What's it called? Differential leveling. Differential leveling is with a level, with an automatic level or a digital level. Yeah. Okay. Part of the reason I'm teaching you guys all these terms is because you need to know it to pass your tests. Right? Okay. We're going to finish up here. We're going to talk about grid layout on buildings and why we do it the way we do it. Because it it's a really good practical, practical application of what we talked about today. So we want to go out and we want to lay out some building grid lines. We're going to try and keep this really simple. So we've got one, two, three. Okay, and then we've got building grid line A, B, and C. Okay, Pat, I want you to always remember one thing about a field crews. So, especially union field crews. They're lazy? Yes. Okay. Never forget that. I never will. All right, okay. So, here's what a lazy field crew will do if you can. 
It's what I would do because I'm lazy. Okay, so you got control point 100 over here. And you got control point 102 over here. And that lazy field crew will backsite on 100. And we need to lay all these out. We need to lay these grid line intersections out. Okay, we'll call them 200, 201, 202. Bear with me, there's a reason I'm numbering these. Okay. So what he'll do is he'll set on 102 and he'll backsite 100 and he'll just start turning angles and distances to all these. Damn. Okay, and I'm gonna explain in a minute why that's not good. Okay, I'm not gonna draw them all. But you go back to our list, what method is he using? He's using, uh, it looks like the, uh, yeah, the side shot. Method number six. Method number six. So if you get it, if you zoom, if you were in CAD and you zoomed in close enough on these shots, what you'd see is grid line number two. Grid line number two is in a straight shot. If you drew it in CAD, it would look like this. Okay? Was very these differences are small, but they're there. Super minor, yeah. So Danny, what do you think we would see right here? I'm just give me a guess. Hundreds. Four hundreds, two hundreds. Oh, it adds up. Okay. But depending on how slot, if he freehanded that and didn't use a bipod, it could be a it could be a half a tenth. Okay? So that is not the right way to lay out grid lines for finish grade. Okay? Okay, so here's how you lay it out for finish grade. Danny, how you lay it out? You set a baseline on your grid lines. Okay, so what you do is you stake out you stake out number two and you set a point here on number two. Okay, and then you turn and you stake out here. And you set a point on the grid line number two on the other end. Then you move your instrument to number two. And you turn and you shoot the other point on number two. And you tell your toll station, set that zero. And now you go out and you measure these distances. Let's say they're 50 feet. So you stake this line out and you come down 50 feet and you set your hub and your tap. You come down 50 feet, you set your hub and your tap. You come down 50 feet, you set your hub and your tap. Now, the reason that is better is we just eliminated error. Which error did we eliminate? Sloppiness. From this setup. Yeah, but which which kind of error? The angle. I'm going to make a survey error to you, and you know, we, eliminated, <laughs> we eliminated the angular error. Because once he sights two and sets his backside, is he turning any angles? No. He no. Right so the right. only error we have left is the distance error. Right? Do you know how much distance error we get in a properly calibrated and cared for toll station? Not a lot. Like, you can not, it's hard to measure. Okay? You've got to remember we can always measure distances better than angles. Always. Horizontal is always better. Okay? Than now, when you plot these points in CAD, your line's going to be pretty straight. Okay? But let's do the math here. If you had to lay this out, if you had to lay these points out with that method, how many setups do you need? Uh, At least. Minimal number of setups. Two. One, two, two, three. You need at least three setups. No, you need more than that. Right? Jump across the but I'll tell you what Danny makes him do. Danny makes him set up on one, two, and three, and then guess what? He makes him do the same thing. They got three more setups the other way, and they come and they check these. Right? So that's six setups to properly lay out the grid, and how many does the lazy guy get to do it with? That's why they're lazy. But that's the part. Now, that is a really beautiful illustration of all the principles we talked about today and how those principles change the way we actually have to do stuff in the field, right? If you don't understand angles and the way a total station works, do you understand why you have to do, why you have to lay grid out the way you do? No. You got, so, like, all this conceptual stuff matters. It changes how we do stuff, right? Okay, go home. Thanks for coming to class. Thanks for coming to class. Super educational. He's not even listening. Okay. I'll, I'll try and upload that. Yeah, he's watching Netflix. That's cool. Look. This was pretty basic. All right, bye, guys. Oh, I don't know how to end. end. Okay, was that helpful at all? Yeah. The quiz and the, yeah, was all right? The quiz beat me up, but. It's all right. That's how you, that's how you get better. Yeah. In a year, you'll be ready.
take your oh, take your CST too. I mean, I'll get it in. You said that 